everyone, welcome back. I hope you had a great weekend. Today we're talking about editing part one. For Wednesday, we're gonna save the stuff about continuity editing and do all of that together. So thanks for reading a part of that. Much more will be said about it on Wednesday. Editing is incredibly powerful as a tool. Um, and an editor and director seemingly has endless possibilities. Editing also gives the director control over space and time. Hollywood movies now average between 1,000 to 2,000 cuts, and typically they have hundreds upon hundreds of hours of film to work with, even if the film will be around two hours. There are multiple different kinds of edits you can do. You can do a cut, which is a jump between one shot and the next. You can do a fade out. You can do a dissolve. You can do a wipe. There are all sorts of other transitions that you can use. Today we're focusing on cuts. Birth of a Nation did showcase a lot of cross-cutting techniques that were not typically seen before, um, and we've already discussed Birth of a Nation and the context it comes from. Editing trends, though, change over time. For instance, you see Star Wars using typically 70s cuts um, and making them um, seem really, really cool, and uh, some of the newer forms of Star Wars have replicated those original forms of edits. I want you to try to see how many cuts are in this from one of my favorite films of all time, Wong Kar Wai's um, In the Mood for Love from 2000. So within this very short time, there are 10 cuts, and so 11 distinct shots.
I'll circle back to this and ask you to think about what graphic, rhythmic, spatial, and temporal editing relations you notice between the shots. To begin, you can have graphic relations between uh, particular shots. Uh, so graphic relations are the pictorial elements between shots, patterns of light and dark, line and shape, volume and depth, movement and stasis across shots. And mise-en-scene and cinematography also furnish these graphic relationships and possibilities. But you can have something either a graphic match or have a more graphic contrast. When you have a graphic match, the composition is picked up from one shot to another, even in really creative ways like aliens, um, the shape of the earth sort of dissolving from the face. It can also be a matter of degree. You could keep the same sort of lighting patterns and avoid color clashing. Um, and I'm going to insert a little something here about the graphic match cut as a really interesting device that's used. Matching on action is standard editing practice in feature films and has been for almost 100 years because this kind of cut smooths over the inherent discontinuity of shot changes. But it can also be done by matching sound, subject matter, frame composition, movement, or even colors and light. Really, anything can be matched across a cut. This is probably familiar to you, but let's set the scene. A woman is getting ready to take a shower. She gets in and then an intruder appears. You likely know the rest. The blood flowing down the drain already signals the finality of the shower sequence in Psycho, but it's the next shot that really cements the hopelessness of what the viewer just witnessed. The shot of the drain slowly dissolves into a close-up of Marion's lifeless eye, as if to metaphorically suggest her life disappeared down that very drain. When a composition is deliberately contrasted from one shot to another, you have graphic contrasts, like the birds, the extended discussion of fire and Melanie, the contrast between the movement of the fire and Melanie's stasis to emphasize uh, sort of her immobility during that time and the, the destructiveness of the fire. <laughs> also have rhythmic relations between shots, which means the patterning of shot lengths to give the film its rhythm. Uh, sometimes you have long shots coupled with short shots, or sometimes you have a, a splice of multiple short shots. You would look to how much time each shot is given in order to determine the kind of mood that the director and editors are trying to create, like suspense. For instance, in the movie Midsummer, longer shots often pan or tilt to reveal elements of a Swedish commune, and as audience members, you're made to think, okay, uh, this doesn't feel right, and then you have that accompanied by a quick cut to a more sunny uh, day or element as if to say, okay, the fact that this is weird doesn't really matter it's another day maybe everything's fine you also see things like flash frames which are one-off accents what if the table too what do you want from me huh you want me to schlep it on my back you got a friend i am a leper slipper she <laughs> such a son a gun if your mother needs you like a moose needs a hat rack you can also have cutaway shots that remove us briefly from the action, like in older Bollywood films. Oftentimes there would be a cutaway shot to flowers when people, when characters were about to kiss, to imply the intimate action without actually showing it. You can have spatial relations between shots, the relations of place and space, and like graphic relations, they can be continuous or discontinuous, uh, meaning you're made to feel like you're in similar or dissimilar places, and they can be clear or ambiguous to the audience. The audience cannot know sometimes uh, where they are, their location is as viewers. Oftentimes, sitcoms use establishing shots, uh, which is an analytical approach that tells the viewer where the scene is. And uh, you can also find that in movies, right? It's a way of telling us and, uh, and getting our sense of place. Um, you can also have re-establishing shots a few shots later uh, to give us, again, that sense of where we are. This is also called deductive editing because we deduce from wider phenomenon, like a larger image of a place to a more specific action in a smaller space. So you deduce from the wider to the smaller. You can also have interframe editing, which is the combination of different shots into one shot to create more layered images. Um, Vertab, who uh, 
uh, pioneered um, filmmaking uh, with Man with the Movie Camera, for instance, uh, did interframe editing. You can also have constructive inductive editing, where the action is determined by how shots are put in relation. We already talked about the Kuleshov method uh, as one uh, inductive editing technique. Oftentimes there's no establishing shot with this, uh, with this to guide the action. The more specific action gives sort of a wider meaning, so that's why it's called inductive. You go from sort of a smaller set of shots um, and gradually the meaning builds, so smaller to wider. Um, I'm going to discuss here a little bit more about the Kuleshov method and I'm going to let Hitchcock explain it a little bit more. We call it cutting. It isn't exactly that. Uh, cutting implies severing something. It really should be called assembly. Mosaic is assembling something to create a whole. Now we have a close-up. Let me show what he sees. Let's assume he saw a woman holding a baby in her arms. Now we cut back to his reaction to what he sees. And he smiles. Now what is he as a character? He's a kindly man. He's sympathetic. Now, let's take the middle piece of film away, the woman with the child. But leave his two pieces of film as they were. Now we'll put in uh, a piece of film of a girl in a bikini. He looks, girl in a bikini, he smiles. What is he now? The dirty old man. He's no longer the benign gentleman who loves babies. That's the difference. That's what film can do for you. Finally, you can have temporal relations. How shots relate in time and uh, have a particular timing. So this relates to chronology. Uh, contend story expand duration and repeated story action. For chronology, that's the order of events. And you could, uh, for instance, change the order of the shots of In the Mood for Love. Um, people oftentimes also include in chronology flashbacks or flash forwards, I think becoming more common with digital aging techniques. With condensed or expand duration, you have elliptical editing where action is presented with less time on screen than it would in real life or in the story like going up the stairs. That's not a really interesting action sometimes for people, so, uh, so people sometimes condense it through elliptical editing. There's also overlapping editing, which leads to expanded duration. For instance, the scene where the baby is rolling down the stairs takes forever. Uh, it's put in slow motion, and it is a shout out to prior film uh, techniques. You can also have repeated story action, like in Do the Right Thing. <laughs> You can even have films that explore multiple timelines by creating forking paths in the plot like La La Land, Groundhog Day, or Edge of Tomorrow. If we go back to In the Mood for Love, this scene, you can see graphic, rhythmic, spatial, and temporal relations much more clearly. So I would just pause for a second and think about it while you watch the clip much more. Can you see graphic, rhythmic, spatial, and temporal relations in this clip? What's really interesting is the long take, or what seems to be the long take. Sometimes there's a false long take where editing techniques make shots seem long. The long take. It's one of the most impressive and conspicuous techniques used in film. It's beloved, esteemed, and debated, especially by viewers aware of the incredible challenge of shooting continuously without cutting. These sequences are made to look as though they are filmed in one shot, when they're actually multiple shots that are carefully stitched together to create the illusion of seamlessness. The technique isn't new. The first director to achieve making a feature film in one continuous shot was Alfred Hitchcock in Rope. By avoiding editing, Hitchcock was able to create a feeling of unblinking suspense. Because of the technological limitations of its time, the film's cut points are actually fairly obvious. Hitchcock used one of the most basic techniques for hiding a cut. Obscure the frame, often with a dark color, dolly in, cut, and then dolly out to reveal the new shot. And I think you'll see more continuous shots in TV episodes like uh, like from Euphoria, um, where the set changes, but they keep 
rolling. And as she walks out, that bathroom breaks away, which allowed our techno crane to basically dolly into the hallway with her. And we keep her in frame as the entire hallway starts to rotate around her. And then the night got weird. There is a, such a thing as cutting too much. Um, for instance, Bohemian Rhapsody was was sort of taking a lot of flack online for just how many cuts they had in this one particular scene. It feels excessive. Why is the dialogue this action uh, filmed um, in terms of cutting, right? I really like what Fandor had promoted where they were thanking people for not cutting and sort of letting things extend um, in really beautiful ways. Okay, next time we're talking about continuity editing, so thanks for hanging in, and, and I hope, again, that this has been informative. Okay, bye.